Harvard, aided and assisted John Wilkes Booth, John H. Surratt, and their confederates in traitorous and murderous conspiracy to kill Abraham Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William Sewell. How do you plead? I am innocent. You aware the trial of the conspirators begins today? What are we to do? Defend one of the eight. Her son John was Booth's right hand. You understand what you've been charged with? You found guilty, you could hang? I am a southerner and a devoted mother, but I have no assassin. Your son was the only one who got away. These are despicable people, the same sort of you risked your life fighting against. Someone must be held accountable. People want that. The military trial of civilians is an atrocity. General, what she did is an atrocity. To ensure the survival of this nation, I would do anything. You have to tell us where your son is. Who side are you on? Trying to defend you. You're trying to save you. Were there ever meetings held at the boarding house? Many and always in secret. You were lying. My mother is innocent. I can't know what's going on in that court. You set the rules, pick the judges. There is no limit to how far the prosecution is willing to go. Gina! You tell John Surratt, unless he surrenders, his mother will be punished for his crimes. Have you ever cared for something greater than yourself? Fathers drafted a constitution precisely for times like this. All in favor? Do not permit this injustice out of revenge. I welcome this kind of examination. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. His head could be seen to move violently forward. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. That's why I don't read the newspaper. I'm a man. I'm 40. What did the president know and when did he know it? I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. As of now, I am in control here in the White House. This is crack cocaine from the White House. It could easily have been heroin or PCP. It's as innocent looking as candy. Good evening, this is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. Anybody who's not willing to change based on what they learn is ignorant. Coffee's for clothes is only. I think we're, we're giving you enough. Go on to Chicago and let's win there. Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is author John Stern, and you're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing and traversing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, court historians, and the textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight, we have episode 121, Crimes and Cover-Ups, 1776 through 1963 with Donald Jeffries. Our guest tonight is accomplished author, journalist, and new podcast host, Donald Jeffries will join us next in the midnight hour. But first, let us meander about a little bit, tidying up our little humble abode. First, back by popular demand, the lone gunman himself, Rob Clark, will be your guest host on the next episode of the Midnight Rider News Show. Now, he has a great topic for you, so make sure you look for that one. It should be up in about four or five days. That's my best guess. Ray Locker will join us the next time I'm back with you. He's the author of Nixon's Gamble, and he's the author of the new Hague's Coup. Now, wow, I've been going through this book, meticulously taking notes and making charts, because that's, well, that's what I do. And I I have a statement to make about this book, and it's not one that I take lightly. Uh, so you'll hear that on that episode as well. And Ray will be doing a two-part episode with us because there was absolutely no way I could possibly get through what I'd like to get through with Ray in one episode. So he has kindly agreed to do two episodes on that book. And as you know, Ray is also doing the cover story for issue two of Garrison. So that's exciting as well. You'll see that in July. Speaking of Garrison... Uh, You know that you can get the PDFE version of the magazine on the website, right? Well, that website, once again, 
for those who may not know, is MidnightRiderNews.com. Now, it's seven ninety nine for 116 pages of information. I think that is a very fair bargain. It's a wonderful magazine, and the writers really hit home runs. They knocked it out of the park. So if you'd like to reserve a print copy of issue three, or issue three, actually it'll be issue two, which is out in July, you can do that on our GoFundMe site. That's GoFundMe.com slash Garrison the Journal. That's GoFundMe.com slash Garrison the Journal. So you can go there and check out the tier donation system. You'll see what can be reserved and at what level. And as I said before, we don't really um, see the GoFundMe site as a store. I mean, yes, you do get something reserved uh, for each level of donation. You know, PBS does the same thing. If you've watched PBS during the fund drive, they, you know, will say something like, well, for $75, for $100, you'll get a DVD set. Well, it's not like you're really buying the DVD set for $100. You're, you're donating to them. And because you were kind enough to donate, you'll get something back for it. So it's not really like a direct purchase. And that's the way that we see it as well. So you do get something at each level, uh, but we do see it as a donation, as, as you really wanting to be part of something special. And we do appreciate that. So thank you to those who have donated. Your names will be in the magazine. I think it's page three or four. Um, so you'll have a thank you from us there. And thank you to those who are considering it right now. I, I know that you're thinking about it, and I know that you just haven't done so yet. But if you do decide to to help us out in that way, thank you so much. Or if you do decide just to buy the magazine when it's out, thank you so much for that as well. We'll be right back with Donald Jeffries. This is Scott Greenberger, the author of The Unexpected President, The Life and Times of Chester A. Arthur. For more on the amazing yet unexpected rise of one of America's most unlikely presidents, listen to episode 42 of the Midnight Rider News Show. Well, this man probably needs no introduction to you. He's no stranger to you, and I'm glad he isn't. He's one of our most popular guests, and he's now the guest that we've had on the show most. This is his sixth appearance on the Midnight Rider News Show. He has a new book out, or will have a new book out, actually, on June 18th, 2019. And I've been lucky enough to read an advanced copy, as usual. Magnificent. Uh, But for those of you who have loved Donald's Hidden History book, as I did, uh, this is really a part one to that. It's really a prequel to that. There is a lot of history to cover in this, so we're splitting this up into two episodes as well. Part two will air in late June after the book is out. But he's the author of Hidden History, Survival of the Richest, and the New Crimes and Cover-Ups, 1776 through 1963. And for those who are wondering, 1963 was the starting point for the Hidden History book, so that's why that is. But before Donald joins us, I want to also say that he's done episodes with us covering his two other books, Hidden History and Survival of the Richest. Great episodes. But if you haven't heard the one that we did on Huey Long, you should. And if you haven't heard the episodes on the death of JFK Jr. and Chappaquiddick, you should hear those as well. He's the best, and he's here tonight. Donald Jeffries. So, Donald, how are you this evening, my friend? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me, SD. Thank you for being back on. And as I said in the intro, you're now our most used or or maybe I should say most abused <laughs> guest that we've had on the show. <laughs> You've been on six times and I consider you to be a major part of this show's history. So thank you, Donald. I feel honored. Now, I've been begging and pleading for two years of sorts for a part two to Hidden History. And, and you've really given us... Um, something better than part two. You've given us a prequel. It's called Crimes and Cover-Ups, 1776 through 1963. So let's start by taking a minute to tell everyone about the book, when it will release, and where they'll be able to find it. Well, it was supposed to be out or actually already in, in May, but uh, they seem to have pushed it back to June 18th, I think it is now. So it'll be our, and certainly it's, it's available for pre-order, and lots of people uh, have pre-ordered it. Uh, it was a long time coming. I started writing it actually... Uh, Gosh, I don't know how many years ago it's been. But uh, fortunately, it's, since it's very kind of old history, I didn't have to do a lot of updating, like uh, more more uh, current event stuff would have to be updated when it kind of drags and lags until uh, publication date. But uh, it was a labor of love, like m- all, my, all my writing is, because I've uh, always been a huge fan of history. The JFK assassination has always come first with me. It's been my first area of interest. But um, I have always, from the time I was a child, I was just incredibly fascinated by the era of the American Revolution and the War for Independence. And uh, people like Patrick Henry and uh, Thomas Jefferson especially, uh, Paul Revere, uh, you know, all the, all John Hancock, all, all the George Washington, all the original patriots, the founding fathers, 
fascinated me. I read their biographies, even as, you know, I was seven, eight years old and I was reading little biographies uh, that were written back when children were pretty much were more uh, uh, able to read a bit better than they are today. But they said so they were more challenging books, even for young people then. That era of history fascinated me. The Boston Tea Party, the idea of, uh, you know, overthrowing the, uh, the, 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 the uh, a more powerful enemy and the king and, and becoming independent. It, even at, again, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old, it really it, it piqued my interest. And so it was kind of natural for me always to have been interested in history. It wasn't until later that I really started getting into the uh, Civil War period. And that was, uh, again, uh, Abraham Lincoln, like almost they're all Americans. He was once a hero of mine, too. And I read lots of his biographies, was fascinated by his character. And uh, early on, after I got into the JFK assassination, I started becoming very interested in the Lincoln assassination, realized uh, that that was uh, a lot of questions open there as well. So uh, I approached it a little bit differently than later, uh, and, and uh, readers will see in the book, I obviously had a sea change uh, regarding my, uh, the way I look at, at Abraham Lincoln now. I went from thinking he was a hero to considering him the greatest tyrant that, uh, that, that ever uh, attained uh, that kind of power maybe in any country, but certainly in, in, uh, in a free country like the United States. So these issues, and it just, you know, if I'm reading, I read a lot of history. Like you, I love history, and I read a lot of conventional history. And uh, then I started reading alternative history, when, where, when and where it's available, and I just kind of drew my own conclusions. And uh, the book, this book is going to be full of uh, Full of controversy, and uh, so I, I'm sure I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be getting a lot of feedback from uh, from both sides. But uh, I, I just approach these things uh, independently. I try to, anyhow, and then I approached everything as from my mindset, which is populist and civil libertarian. And I think, uh, and you know, the facts are what the facts are. And I, I just object to what I call Mick history and the cartoonization of history, where you have these uh, impossibly heroic figures and uh, these impossibly demonic villains. And most often, as I write in the book, a lot of times actually uh, the villains are more like heroes and the heroes are more like villains. Well, you're no stranger to controversy, so why change now? (laughs) Well, the new book begins with 1776, so let's also start there. Now, when I taught high school history, one of the books that I used and that I required was a work called Patriots by A.J. Lang Guth. He's since passed. He was a fine journalist who did some outstanding work. But Patriots tops my list of mainstream history books. It's number one. It's a must-have. It's just outstanding from cover to cover. But one of the things I love most about it is that the first chapter is largely devoted to James Otis. Now, you wrote about James Otis and a few others from that era who deserve to be noticed. But James Otis was a monumental figure in his time. Yeah, and, and he, Otis was, was uh, certainly, I believe, he influenced Thomas Paine quite a bit. And uh, these are the forgotten people. What, what's so noticeable when writing about the history of the history then as compared to, say, history now is that... Uh, most people understand, for instance, George Washington was was actually – he was no armchair warrior. He was actually on his horse, and he was leading troops into battle. That was the norm back then. So a lot of these, 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 uh, these founders that really did risk and in most cases lost huge fortunes – they were the one percenters of their day – almost all of them actually went into war. Unlike, it's inconceivable – that uh, the Lindsey Grahams and the John Boltons and people like that today that would be anywhere near a battlefield. It's, it's laughable to even consider it. But at that time, that's what they were. And many of them died, as I put out. And, and uh, I don't think Otis died in battle, but uh, and they've become forgotten to history. And, and it's, it's easy to see why they become forgotten to history, because the names that have gone down that were too big to be ignored, Washington, Jefferson, both the Adamses, Hancock, Patrick Henry, they have been shunned as well. I have a whole section of the book, and I had actually written a, an article on my blog about Hollywood Hates the Founding Fathers a few years back, and I talked about how it took me until I was an adult to realize, and, and I'm a film buff as well. I, I know a lot about the golden age of Hollywood. That's, what, that's the book I'm writing now. I'm writing a book about show business. Uh, but it, it, it's amazing to consider that Hollywood has still never to this day had a single film devoted to the life and times of George Washington, the father of our country. They've never had one devoted to Thomas Jefferson. They've never had one devoted to John Adams, to Patrick Henry. They did have one to Alexander Hamilton. 
And that's that's no accident because he was the as I I write a lot about him in the book about how he was different than the other founding fathers. He was kind of a Henry Kissinger of his day. He would have fit he would fit in well today. He was the father of debt. Uh, he was the one who wanted to you know the, wanted the central bank. He was the banker's favorite founding father. And that's why he's become a hip young black star in Broadway now. It's no accident that's him and not and no one else. That's the one they're pushing. All the other ones are just dead white guys who, you know, basically should never have lived in their ideas. But, but there's reason for that is because the the less you focus on their lies and the less you focus on their principles, their ideals, and the revolution itself, the war for independence. If you don't discuss it ever, then you don't know. Uh, young people especially don't because then they might start getting ideas. Wait a minute, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, you know, every 20 years, uh, you know, the, the tree of liberty needs to be replenished with the blood of tyrants and patriots, that kind of thing. And and there are lots of those quotes in the record from Jefferson and others that indicate that uh, when the people grow tired of this government, as perfect as they thought it was, or as great, and, as, and certainly in retrospect, I think the form of government they came up with is about as perfect as can be. And you know, I don't, I don't think anyone's ever designed a better one. It's just, it's a shame that our leaders, at least since the time of Lincoln, haven't, uh, haven't, uh, you know, governed within the framework of the Constitution and within the separation of powers. But um, the, the less that is paid attention to their lives and to the, the in war for independence itself, the better it is for the, t- the, the people, the tyrannical leaders who rule us today and have been ruling us for a long time. Because as I point out in the book, and I, I've said many times, I don't know anybody, any leading figure on the stage today that w- if, if they could go back in time, none of them would have been on the side of the, uh, the colonists who were fighting in for independence. Because everything they were fighting for goes against everything they have, have they've been governing under, their entire belief system, this statism, this totalitarianism or creeping totalitarianism, this uh, this owner's tyranny that we see everywhere that uh, where liberties are not respected. So I I like to focus on that era because to show people that hey you know this is if there ever was a greatest generation it certainly wasn't the World War II generation it was the generation of the founding fathers. You know, I've always had a bit of a, a bit of crankiness regarding no taxation without representation because we have obviously let that go. And it's always bothered me yeah. that these high school students, 16 and 17 years old, they have taxes withheld from their paychecks, yet they can't vote until they're 18. And it used to be till, tw- it used to be till 21. Right, right, right. It did right, yeah. until 1971 and the 26th Amendment to the Constitution. But now I want to be straight here. I'm not advocating that 16-year-olds vote, but if they can't vote, they shouldn't be taxed at all on their paychecks through an income tax, at least until they're 18. That's more of my problem with it as it is today. But the sad part really is to me that high school students that I know don't even seem to care. Right. Why? No, and well, I think, you know, most Americans are historically illiterate. I've said that many times, and certainly high schools, the younger they are. Uh, because they're, they've come along now under uh, further down the road of dumbed down education, uh, the matrix world of uh, smartphones and all, all that stuff that we've, you know, has been, it's been discussed forever that keep, take, keep, certainly does not, is not compatible with studying history in an honest way. It's just, it's just, you know, it, it's, you know, you're more concerned about what the coolest new video game is or whatever, or the newest app. But, um, for those again, for for the, the the Otis quote about no taxation without representation, that is one of the 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 bedrocks of our it was supposed to be one of the bedrocks of our constitutional republic, and that they, now they can't. That's a quote that is is has gone down the memory hole. You're not going to find that. Man. You're not going to in Ivy League uh, colleges and so forth because again, people get the idea that what do we have now? We have uh, we may not be as literally having a taxation without representation is, is the high school students who don't have a right to vote. But for all intents and purposes, our vote is pointless because we have, back when the banker bailout of 2008 occurred, every single poll showed 96, 97% of Americans opposed to it. Our leaders did it. So if that's not taxation without representation, there are other examples of that as well. But certainly on immigration, other issues like that, you can see that the, 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 uh, the dichotomy between our leader, our political leadership, our so-called representatives, and what the actual people, what their constituents want, is so is growing so wide that it's it's absolutely 
incomprehensible. And I, again, I don't know other, especially for a country that proclaims it's, it's one thing to be a Soviet Union, where you're not really proclaiming that you're, you know, you're, you're a, a democracy and a beacon of light to the world. But we still do that. And for us to have that kind of what we, it's definitely we have taxation on that representative. James Otis and RC people could be alive today. They, every one of them, they would be into the farthest corners of uh, right-wing extremism. Uh, you wouldn't even be able to find them. They'd be so out of the mainstream, other than Alexander Hamilton, maybe Benjamin Franklin. All the rest of them, none of them would be welcome. And George Washington, his farewell address, his farewell address contradicts every thing about American so-called bipartisan foreign policy that has existed for close to 100 years now. So uh, how how would he – he's the father of our country. So again, they can't quote that because – Everything he says, and it just it, you, they you sound worse than the the worst, uh, craziest uh, extremist that's unwelcome anywhere on the internet, and, be, and is being censored now with the rest of you, so-called wackos. That's what they would all sound like. Mm -hmm. Well, you note in the book that even for decades after the American Revolution, people from Boston still only spoke of George Washington and not of Adams or Otis or Henry or anyone. Um, just Washington. And Washington was a Virginian. We know that he wasn't from Massachusetts. But even then, you know, history sort of coalesced around one person rather than a movement of sorts. Well, I think even then, uh, although obviously we weren't as dumbed down as we were, I, I don't know what the stats are. I think I wrote in the original Hidden History. I, I think not as there were lots more literally illiterate people back then. So a, a lot of people didn't read. And I think even at that time, maybe uh, it was easier. It's always been easier, uh, I think, for for uh, events to be framed, as I talked to, even back then, where you pick a, a, a symbolic figure. And it's almost like what Oliver Stone did in JFK. He picked Garrison to rally all those researchers behind and got a lot of the other researchers ticked off. But it's, it's, it's so I think that Washington, because he was the first president, because he... Uh, he set the tone by giving up what could have been incredible power. Uh, he could have been a king. People like Hamilton wanted him to be a king. They wanted a monarchy. They didn't want a democracy. But Washington, and, and he stepped down willingly after eight years. He could have been president for life. But I think because he had set, and the, the myths began, I think the first biographies have appeared about him uh, you know, in the early 1800s. And I didn't, you know, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down a cherry, you know, I when I cut down the cherry tree, throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac River, things like that, that I was still learning as as a student in the 1960s in school. So these were myths, and I think they're they're important. I think in a way, it, 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 they're done in the right uh, for the right reasons, which I think those myths were. And I think they just kind of rally behind him as a symbolic figure, especially people like Otis, because he died before his time, and. Um, uh, people like Patrick Henry, although he still got some press up to the time when I was in school, but he wasn't really part of that uh, beginnings of our government. I think the people that got the press were Washington, Jefferson, Adams, because they were the first three presidents. Um, Hamilton more so as time went on, as, our, as our, the court historians really dug in and began to take over history and wanted to twist it. And of course, Ben Franklin, who was this great inventor, and he was... Uh, you know, well, I guess well-known figure in Paris and so forth. So I think they just kind of picked the hands. One people like Sam Adams was forgotten for a long time. John Hancock was unknown outside of you know the fact he was his name was so big you know, <clears throat> on the Declaration of Independence, and uh, forgotten is you know he was a huge one percenter and he he remained true to the revolutionary spirit. Is right where Sam Adams kind of veered off there, and, and uh, unfortunately, but um, so I think they. They they decided, and I think that happens all the time in history, where even uh, maybe unintentionally, people like uh, James Otis and, and some of the others I mentioned kind of get forgotten. But um, hopefully, you know, a few more people that that read this book will will learn their names and understand that it was a, a more of a concerted effort. It wasn't just a couple people. In class, it was always important to me to get the students to understand what it was to have Hancock and Sam Adams being chased through the countryside by the Redcoats. Now, I mean, this was one of the colony's richest men and one of the most well-known spiritual leaders of the day. And 
I made the what if comparison to America being invaded and Bill Gates is running through the countryside <laughs> with Joel Olstein yeah, that's, that's fair. and they're working on the side of revolution. <laughs> that's how bizarre it was. And, yeah. and we now see them as revolutionaries, as you said, Hancock signing his, well, John Hancock, mm -hmm. but it was that kind of scene. It was a bizarre moment in American history. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's, I think that's why it's important to me because really the reason that happened in the course back then, it would have been, it, it, it's an entirely different situation now because we've allowed this tyranny and this corruption. That's why I, when I quote from the Declaration of Independence, if people read that today, understand what Thomas Jefferson was talking about, a series of uninterrupted events that you know, show such a pattern of tyranny. The, I mean, I don't know what he would think of the tyranny that Americans have endured for, I said, you know, at least increasingly over the past century, at least. And really going back to the Civil War, where I think so much of this started, where we really started going down that dark path, and we've never come back from that. It, you know, as you know, that article I wrote for your journal, The Awful Precedents of Abraham Lincoln, where I think he, he set so many precedents that were uh, unenvisioned by the Founding Fathers. Because up until Lincoln, the first, the first 15 presidents, I can find not a whole lot of fault with. Uh, Polk, I, I, you know, the war with Mexico, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have supported that. So maybe Polk, who, of course, now because he was a pro-war president, all pro-war presidents get high marks from the court historians. And you'll find if you look at the ones that are ranked the highest, they're the war presidents, every single one. And uh, other than that, the other 14, you know, yeah, I, I, I would have been more of a Jeffersonian Democrat. I would have been on their side. But, you know, the, the Adamses were pretty good people on the other side. John Adams and John Quincy Adams especially was brilliant. Folks, I mean, these, these were real statesmen. So you had uh, you had a completely different caliber of leadership, and none of them envisioned. They had they had debates, already debating about slavery and things like that, but none of them envisioned doing uh, overstepping the boundaries of, of the constitutional authority that that Lincoln would do. And we've never looked back from then. So I think there's a story uh, of our founding, and that's why I concentrate on that quite a bit. And then I, I devote even more attention to the Civil War era, because I think that's when really, uh, uh, when we look back, unfortunately, that's our legacy. And a lot of people at the time called it the Second Revolution because it contradicted so much. I mean, it, it on the face of it, it completely overturned the entire purpose behind the revolution because the whole idea of revolting from England was that we that we had a right to not only a, a representation with our taxation, but we had a right Every people has a right to consent to be governed. So the, the colonists weren't consenting. And come 1860, the southern states that wanted to break away didn't want to consent anymore either. So what was the difference? And I think it turned everything on its head. And I don't think we've ever recovered. And I think that the, the, the cultural divide we find today in the country that with Donald Trump as a lightning rod in the middle, he's just the, the lightning rod. But I think so much of it goes back to the Civil War, how it was conducted, the bloodbath, the Reconstruction afterwards, the 100 years of Jim Crow and all that. All that, I think, stems from that. I really do. And unfortunately, our real legacy should be the founding, and it should be the Revolutionary War. But because it uh, isn't mentioned much, because it contradicts everything about today's political climate, and even probably even the most dim-witted Americans might actually start asking questions. Wait a minute, you know that's <laughs> that's that's nothing like our government. Let me just look at George Washington's foreign policy, his uh, his farewell address. I mean, what what American wouldn't? Qu Wait a minute, that's this is George Washington, the great hero. Uh, why are we at war all the time? We have entangling alliances everywhere. You know, uh, what? Donald, if you only knew how many times a week the phrase entangling alliances runs through my head. You know, Washington's farewell address. That speech is still one of. America's most prophetic moments. You know, there are these moments when we had a choice of where we were going, and that was one of them. And we immediately went the wrong direction. You know, that that, that party split between yeah. the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. That split led us to where we are now, yeah. sadly. And the most debated founding father has to be the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Now, he's the founder of the University of Virginia, and he's now called a racist to the extent that you quote Paul Finkelman, who says that, quote, in many ways, Jefferson invented racism <laughs> yeah. in America, unquote. Yeah. Yeah. Invented. 
Now, there's still the question of Sally Hemings that comes up quite often, although there's a, a lot of DNA debate on that. And then we have a debate regarding his writing of the Declaration of Independence now. You know, James Perloff has this essay, and it's a surprisingly convincing one, discussing this idea that he believes that Thomas Paine actually authored the majority of the Declaration of Independence and not Thomas Jefferson. So we still can't decide as a nation how we feel about him. Why is that? Well, I think that, uh, and you know, certainly Thomas Mann. I write, I write about him in the book as well. He was a, he was a figure that was treated uh, so shabbily that uh, no one seems to even know where most of his body is now. I mean, I write about that. It's just it's a really an incredible you know, story. And his his pamphlet Common Sense was uh, kind of the Smedley Butler uh, you know uh, wars a racket of its day. Whereas a little pamphlet that got everybody, it's you know, a lot of people read it and got them fired up. But I think. You know, regardless of who wrote it, the the ideals in the Declaration of Independence are timeless. And I don't know, I think because Jefferson was a, uh, everything we know about the guy, he he had a lot of populism in him, and that's what attracts me to him. Uh, He was a a classical liberal. And to me, when I think back, when I think of classical liberals, the first name that pops in my head is Thomas Jefferson. And that's what I consider myself. And he was he was the most enlightened man of his time, I, I believe. And that's why to, to, to pick on him, I mean, you, you could certainly make the argument, I mean, by today's standards, 99.9% of the white people alive in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in 1776, or even 1865, were racist by today's standards. It was, obviously, it was a completely different world. But Jefferson at least recognized how wrong the institution of slavery was. He was entrenched in it. And he, 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 there was a very strong condemnation of the slave trade that, w- that was removed from the Declaration of the Independence against his wishes. He wanted that left in there. So the idea that, that he has become the, the poster boy for racism is ridiculous. And, the, and I, know, I know it's all it's built on. And I, I explain there, there, there are reasons why, for instance, he didn't free his slaves. Jefferson, um, one of the... Um, Unfortunate parts of his character was that he was, although he didn't write that way, but like a lot of people, he didn't live his life the way up to, up to his own principles. He was very financially irresponsible his entire life. He was always in debt, although he didn't believe in debt uh, for a country, but he was always in debt. He always had financial problems. He was very generous with his money and kind of spent freely. And uh, by all accounts, he, he, was, he was kind to everyone, uh, you know, as, as kind as someone could be, being a master of slaves and so forth. But he didn't free his slaves because he believed he had a philosophy, he had a plan. And I, I write about it in the book. He wanted a gradual, incremental abolition where the, the slaves would be freed in increments. Because he, he foresaw what happened, the way they were, where they were kind of thrown in the deep end of the pool. I mean, they were, they were banned from reading almost all of them, for, by, by law. And uh, so they were, they, were, they were completely ill-equipped to suddenly, and, and plus, again, as I said, 99.9% of white people at that time, were, even though only like 5% ever owned slaves, the rest of them were used to, as Abraham Lincoln said, you know, I want the white race in the upper hand, you know, in the part of the relationship. They were used to a certain way of thinking. To suddenly throw that out there and expect everything to change overnight uh, it was ridiculous. It was the most absurd proposition ever, and we saw what happened. You had 100 years, and as Langston Hughes wrote, what happened to a dream deferred, does it explode? Well, it finally exploded to a degree 100 years later with the Civil Rights Movement. But all that stuff that happened was, uh, was because we went about it. We didn't go about it in Jefferson's way. Jefferson wanted to gradually educate them. He wanted to get them on an equal footing gradually up to a certain point every, every child born past this day is born free. He understood that a lot of, I mean, and that actually happened. A lot of the slaves, I mean, they were, what were they going to do? I mean, where were they going to suddenly, first of all, they were, they were going to encounter an intense prejudice and hostility from people that probably weren't hostile to them before. But now with this newfound relationship where they're considered, you know, they're equal, that was obviously going to uh, uh, create all kinds of uh, division. And I think Jefferson had a, a much better long-term plan but unfortunately, his, his way wasn't chosen, and he, just because he didn't free them at his death. And I, I, I think he, he, he should have, but you know, again, I, he probably should have managed his money better, too. But Jefferson was a complex character, and his, uh, if he did have an affair with Sally Hemings, as I point out, the DNA tests that were done 
were not uh, totally conclusive because they, they didn't do all the DNA tests. And all it demonstrated was that one of her children, and it wasn't the child she had when she was a teenager. So all nonsense about uh, Jefferson was Jefferson DNA was excluded from the child that she bore when she was a teenager. So all these people that still call him a rapist and a pedophile, it's absolute nonsense. Whatever he was, he couldn't have been that. But you don't hear anybody else saying that. It's possible that a Jefferson male, and as I understand, there were twenty some of them that could have been could have been the father, fathered one of her children, but it wasn't that one. So is it possible? Sure, it's possible, but we also have to consider Jefferson's life as well. He, his wife, who died young, made what I think is a pretty selfish demand on her deathbed, and she demanded that he never remarry. And Jefferson was a man. He, wasn't, he was still pretty young. Uh, you know, it's a famous guy. I'm sure he had women throwing themselves at all the time. But in, I, I think that probably happened a lot where uh, because of the master-slave relationship, you know, they, they could at least have a, a sexual relationship with somebody where that might not be possible, especially if you weren't going to marry them. And here Jefferson is, is he, he held that he, – he was bound by his wife's, uh, you know, uh, making him promise not to marry again. So no one ever factors that in because they don't – they have. It's like everything else in the social justice warrior. When you're looking at Jefferson, the, the people that are looking at him now are looking him th- at him through that identity politics prism, and everything is okay. Is uh, you know he he might not have been as sympathetic to transgenderism as we would like either. You know this is you have to consider the kind of for his time, he was an incredibly enlightened guy. He was a, he was a classical liberal, and of course he had flaws. They all did, but uh, to to denigrate him over that and just to cavalierly dismiss him and say that uh, that he raped Sally Hemings and all this stuff, it's just nonsense. It hasn't been proven. And I compare that where everyone has been g- gone all in on that, that, you know, yeah, they, they had Sally Hemings, they just, you know, he's, he was sleeping with her father, all her children, all that, forget the evidence. But Benjamin Franklin, who has a much better reputation with the court historians, they find a bunch of skeletons in the basement of one of his homes in London in, in 1998, and everybody, the same court historians and, and, and news reporters, journalists, jump all over themselves to say, oh, there's no way he, there's no way he knew about it. And they blame the, the young doctor he was living with, who died very young and very conveniently in a typical and natural way when one investigates these things. And, you know, why, why is, again, it's, it's unequal standards for whatever reason, uh, Franklin is seen favorably, not quite as favorably as Alexander Hamilton, and Jefferson is at the bottom of that list. And I, I really don't know why he fares worse than people like Madison, for instance. I mean, Madison owns slaves. I, I don't, I don't really understand it. But I think maybe Jefferson, because Jefferson left so many incredible thoughts on the record, maybe it's in their best interest to uh, to try to smear someone who who did talk over and over again about the people. How- that's not uh, that is not meeting their standards. Well, speaking of those skeletons in the closet or skeletons in the basement in Franklin's mm-hmm. case, there's one more revolutionary era figure that I'd like to ask about. And I think he's someone who should possibly be tied to more of the era's events than he is. Who is Adam Weishaupt? Well, Weishaupt is a, he's a favorite of the conspiracy world. He was the he's a real person. He's a, he's a professor at Ingolstadt University. And he uh, he founded the Bavarian Illuminati in 1776, the same time uh, frame as the American Revolution. Um, there, and I, I quote the letter. There was George Washington was uh, discussing him in a letter. Thomas Jefferson defended him, but he, you know, Jefferson was enlightened, and he thought he thought that Weishaupt was striking a blow against uh, tyrannical organized religion and so forth. As a free thinker, he was attracted to him. Where. Washington was more concerned that uh, that Weishaupt was infiltrating, and he definitely was infiltrating Freemasonry. And a lot of people have uh, suspected that Freemasonry really took a, a, a dark turn there uh, after the uh, Illuminati was founded, because uh, so many uh, people in the Illuminati were infiltrating these lodges and uh, trying to make it, uh, I guess, more occultic, more satanic, or whatever. But uh, I, I have lots of quotes from Weishaupt in the book, and uh, you know they don't they don't sound very innocuous to me. It, it certainly sounds to me like he was, whether he accomplished that or not, I don't know. But the Illuminati is kind of the number one seed still. When people ask uh, the people that are 
that believe in conspiracies when they ask, okay, well, who's, who's the top? You know, who who's runs everything? People usually go to the Illuminati. And that's, you know, what, what, if that's true, who knows? I mean, we're, they're, they're not going to be anywhere where you can see them. They're not coming out in the open. So if they did exist, it would be behind the scenes or above it all. So, but I think he, uh, at least they, uh, they, uh, they acknowledge he existed now. And uh, usually they try to slough off. As I, I have a couple of quotes in there from court historians who are trying to, you know, explain, innocently explain his, uh, his beliefs. And they, you know, they would certainly scoff at the, at the idea that free, uh, that, uh, Illuminati had any kind of a long-lasting impact on Freemasonry or anything else. Well, the paintings done of Washington and his Freemasonry garb and his, his reliance on the Society of Cincinnati, that's not meaningless. And, but, and to ignore something doesn't necessarily make it history. But the court historians, then, you know, they do what they do, and they'll always ignore that, and they'll always the, ignore the importance of those things. But let's talk about Andrew Jackson, because like Jefferson, I think Americans are really unsure yeah. what to make of him to the point that their opinions of him also change with the times. But even those in our field are unsure as well. And yes, he's the man who sets out to destroy the corrupt and elitist Bank of the United States. But then he's also the Trail of Tears. And you devote an entire chapter to Jackson and Jacksonian democracy. So you saw the importance of the era. So what is it then about Jackson that we just aren't correctly analyzing as an American public? Well, I think he – and again, you talk about a flawed individual. I mean part of him I hate because uh, not only was his treatment – I mean, he, and he, he is one that clearly – there's no question he's, he was a racist even for his era. He hated India. But as I point a lot of these American leaders hated it. Going down to Theodore Roosevelt, hated Indians, hated American Indians. He really did. The Trail of Tears was obviously a terrible tragedy. And Jackson was one of these guys who loved war way too much for my taste. Now, he was a Teddy Roosevelt type. Again, he was a, a warrior himself. So he, you know, he was a hero of Yorktown. That's why, it, it, you know, why he uh, ended up uh, uh, going, going to, not hero of Yorktown, hero of, um, oh God, what's, what's the battle that he was the hero of? <laughs> Uh, it was the Battle of New Orleans, New Orleans which uh, was right. January 8, 1815. And the quirky fact about that is that it ended up being a meaningless battle because the Treaty of Ghent had already been signed two weeks earlier, thus already ending the War of 1812. So Jackson's greatest military moment was unneeded, uh, other than, of course, for Johnny Horton's musical <laughs> career in 1959. Yeah, exactly. So, but he, that was his personality. He loved war. I mean, like one of my favorite writers, Ambrose Bierce, is another guy who I love him. I thought he was incredibly enlightened, but he loved war. Some of these people that I can still admire, it being the peace lover that I am and, and being opposed to Mushroom All War, I can admire their qualities. And at least I have a little respect for the people that are actually are not chicken hawks, that are actually willing to fight it themselves. But Jackson was a very problematic personality. But he was a real, he had the populist impulse uh, when he invited the riffraffs into the White House and they kind of destroyed things. I mean, that was, that was a cool thing, I thought. And it was the only time that's ever happened. No other president's ever invited the public in like that. And um, certainly his, his, his fight against the banks, and he's got tons of quotes out there, is something that uh, still arouses my interest in him and why I uh, write generally favorably of him because he was uh, battling one of the biggest foes of the era, and that was the uh, the the the, uh, in, the uh, campaign started by Alexander Hamilton and his crowd to uh, get that uh, central bank instituted as a, a permanent fixture in American society. And of course, they would finally achieve that in 1913 with the Federal Reserve System. And uh, we can see, you know, American the American economy has never been the same. Right. Now, okay, Donald. Uh... I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, but I've had Abraham Lincoln thrust into my brain from birth. Uh, I still see Land of Lincoln on every license plate as I drive. He still ranks either first or second in every right. presidential performance survey of historians that's taken, especially the most recent ones done by C-SPAN. And the truth is always more complex than the image. That's what you write about so often and so well. And we should all expect that as Americans, that, that our history has been whitewashed yeah. to some degree. Now, you've, in, you've included three sections entitled Lincoln the Racist, Lincoln the Warmonger, and Lincoln the Atheist. So it's obviously unclear how you feel about them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should also point out that in the first issue of Deep Truth Journal, your essay was entitled Lincoln's Awful Precedents. So 
what is it that we do not understand about Abraham Lincoln? Well, as, as Thomas DiLorenzo, who's a professor, I think, at George Mason, out near me, who wrote The Real Lincoln and Lincoln on Mass, and his work was very influential in, in turning me, me uh, into that uh, completely different perspective towards Lincoln. As he said, there, he calls them the Lincoln cult. And it's a Lincoln cult of university professors and uh, court historians. And he said, the Lincoln cult means making an excuse for everything Lincoln did. Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Well, he had to. It was at war. You know, Lincoln overstepped his bounds over and over. Well, he had to. There was a rebellion. Well, we had a rebellion at the founding of the Republic, and and that's supposed to be our right. Well, no, he had to. He had to keep the Union. So there's an excuse for everything he did. He tried to have the the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court arrested. Luckily, he was talked out of it because the the Chief Justice condemned. He said, no, you don't have the right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. We still don't know how many people were thrown into makeshift prisons. And during Lincoln's reign of terror, we they have no idea. They didn't because they, there were no records kept. And there were books written by people like uh, uh, Frank Key Howard, who was Francis Scott Key's grandson, who was one of those locked up. And, and, and the, the, talk about irony, he was locked up in Fort McHenry, which is where the famous Star Spangled Banner was written about, about the, the flag flying over Fort McHenry. So, I mean, could anything be more uh, emblematic of all that was wrong? with that air and what a wrong turn we took than that. Lincoln, as even a court historian I quote said, it would be hard to understand, to figure out what Lincoln thought the, the, uh, the, the, where his powers ended. He thought he had unlimited powers. We were at war and we, the only reason we were at war was because Lincoln pushed it. If he had just let the original seven states secede from the union, I think most people at the time that were reasonable and are still reasonable today would, would simply assume like, they wouldn't have been able to make it on their own. Probably it was impractical. You're in the same big land mass, uh, trade and all that. So it, it probably wouldn't have worked for them, but they probably would have come back to the union with the tail between their legs after you know, a year or two or something. But he couldn't do that. Instead, he, he, he quashed down, he invaded Baltimore, all the stuff he did, and that brought the other six states uh, to secede. So you had a, a, a little bit more of a, a powerful foe to go against, and we saw what happened. It was four years of, of bloodshed where we lost uh, between 600 and 800,000. The higher estimates now say 800,000. Uh, one quarter of the entire South, the males, the males in the South, one quarter. I mean, that's just amazing. You talk about a lost generation. And uh, not to mention all, the, all the, the people that came home, maimed and so forth. Just uh, devastating. And what it, it just the, 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 the way the South was destroyed, the, the crops raised, and the, I talk all about the invention of total war, the invention of the scorched earth policy, things that, that uh, people hadn't thought of doing up until that point. These, these were new concepts. And uh, Lincoln and uh, Grant and Sheridan and uh, especially Sherman, they were, if, if they weren't war criminals, there's no such thing as a war criminal because they, they up until that point, there was some kind of honor in war. There were, uh, you know, kind of unofficial rules of warfare. And one was you, you didn't just go cavalierly rape women of the enemy. You didn't, uh, you didn't uh, injure women and children, defenseless women and children. You didn't burn crops and steal property. I, I have a, uh, a letter that I quote from, and I think it's the most important letter, writ, uh, most illuminating letter, anyhow, written during the Civil War by uh, Lieutenant Thomas Myers, a Union uh, lieutenant. And he describes in depth the uh, the system of theft that was run through General Sherman, and he actually is kind of complaining. He's right about you know how they only they didn't you know he talks about all the great stuff they got, and, he, and at one point he says General Sherman himself has enough gold and silver to start his own bank, and you know this is this is un, these are our heroes, common thieves, rapists. I, I have accounts. I, I again these are you're not going to find these in Ken Burns documentaries. Or uh, or court or historian approved uh, books, but if you look at the actual documents, the letters and the the uh, the newspaper articles at the time, even in the North, because there was a great deal of opposition in the North to what was going on, because Lincoln didn't lock everyone up. He shut down untold numbers of newspapers and so forth that objected to his policies, but there was still enough left in the historical record uh, to show that uh, people understood that what was going on is wrong. And there, there was so much rape, especially, ironically, the Union troops on slave women. For whatever reason, I don't know if they had some kind of uh, 
misguided chivalry where they thought, well, we really can't wait, rape these white women, but we can rape the slaves. I don't know. But it was, there's accounts everywhere that, uh, that uh, this, this was going on. So this is, this is hardly heroic. And these are the good guys. We're told these are the good guys. And I think if you look at it, and, and, and the problem is when you, you write about this, and it's the same thing when, later, you know, when maybe the next episode we'll talk about the World War II era, you end up being, okay, well, you must support slavery. You're a confederate. Well, that, that's not the point at all. The point is that it, these are, you're saying these are the good guys. Now, I don't know what the, the Southern troops did, but I, I know they've been accused of terrible stuff. So, you know, but that's not hidden history. I'm trying to expose that this, this is what is hidden. And if you're going to be wear the mantle of the good guys and you're going to present this as this was good versus evil, then you have to have something good to portray on that other side. And I don't see, I, and I talk about, uh, you know, General Sherman himself writing about Lincoln laughing hysterically at all the tales of the women and children and then burning the crops and stuff as he, uh, as he stormed uh, through the South. I mean, this is, this, is, this is our greatest icon. This is the guy that we revere above any other. So I, I think that um, from a psychological viewpoint, especially Lincoln, to have him as the, uh, the secular saint of our civilization tell, tells, a, tells us way too much in a negative way about where our, our culture is at this point, because this is the guy, and it's probably appropriate, because we've seen how, how you know, what kind of condition our country is in. But, and you can only keep that up by this mythology, the father Abraham, as I point out. Lincoln was every bit as racist as every other major politician of his day was, and I, especially by today's standards. And I, I have all the quotes on the record. The word slavery didn't even appear in his, in his uh, first uh, State of the Union address. He didn't even, he started talking about slavery and, and the emancipation movement. I mean, this is the guy that said, you know, if I, if I could save the Union by freeing uh, every slave, I'd do it, or by freeing no slave, I would do it. Some of the slaves, I'd do it. It wasn't about slavery. It was never about, and then he decided in a pragmatic, and he was a pragmatic politician. He decided, okay, let's, let's turn this into kind of a moral thing about slavery. So he he halfway through the war he converted into that. But uh, you know, I have a quote from General Grant. It said, "If I if I thought I was fighting to end slavery, I'd hang up my sword tomorrow." I mean, these these the, the Union troops didn't think that for a second. And then towards the end of the war, Lincoln. That's why I think that really Lincoln's religious views are are not really even significant, other than the fact that he invoked this religious imagery imagery over and over again, and he started blaming God for the war. Apparently, something he didn't even believe in, but. This, so I think it's all important to consider that uh, Lincoln was a, a tremendous hypocrite, uh, a base politician, and I think uh, the historical record, there are some indications out there, we can never know at this point, but I, I believe that the nickname Honest Abe was probably bestowed upon him early in his career uh, for the same reason you'd call a, a fat guy s slim. You know, you know and I, I think it was a, a term of derision, but... <laughs> But you know uh, this. But this is our this is our number one guy. So, and of course, the fact that he was assassinated the way he was, and then the same court historians who make excuse after excuse for everything he did don't want to delve into the true circumstances of his assassination, and they they just like everything else. So they stay. It's 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 so much. And this book talks about court historians much more than hidden history did, because. Uh, these are older events, and they've been written about more because of the course of time. And you can really see the, the impact that the court historians have, the people that uphold the false narratives of the past in the same way that the mainstream media journalists of today uphold and pass on the, the, uh, the, the, the fake news and the, uh, the uh, dishonest narratives of the present. Well, we're absolutely going to talk about the assassination in one moment, but I want to get back to this if we could. How do we know for sure again that he was an atheist? Well, again, I, I just I put the evidences. There were lots of quotes on the record that indicate there there is indi there are indication from some testimony that Lincoln actually uh, uh, re rewrote like, wrote like a uh, an answer to the Bible or something like a, or a, a rebuttal to the Bible or something when he was young and I. I, I have the quotes in the book. I mean, the readers can decide for themselves, but it seems the people that knew him best uh, indicate. And again, it's the, the only reason I think that's important 
is because of what he represented himself as and what he's been represented as. He's kind of represented as this uh, this deity and somebody who was fighting, you know, for although he blamed God for the war. You know, he he said, you know, this is God Almighty's will or something like that, which is ridiculous. It was Abraham Lincoln's will because, I mean, as I point in, the entire heat was not flexible at all. And the South, one, one of the, I think, the unfairest <coughs> criticisms of the uh, – the South there is, is, is this, the idea of prisoners, where the South constantly kept trying to pray, trade their prisoners of war because they couldn't feed them. They couldn't feed themselves. The, the Union was, the Union troops, Sherman's troops were, and Sheridan's troops were burning crops, salting the earth. They had no food for themselves. How were they supposed to feed northern prisoners? They tried to trade, and when that didn't happen, they actually tried to just get the North to take their own prisoners back without exchange. They still wouldn't do it. In fact, uh, Commander Wirtz, who was later hung in one of the earliest examples of incredible injustice, uh, the, the commandant of Andersonville Prison, uh, in an incredibly uh, unjust move, he actually uh, shipped his prisoners uh, to a, a place in Florida where it was run by the Union, and the Union troops forced them back, and they forced them to take the, troops, the, the prisoners back. So this, but you don't get this in the history books. This is what this is why it's hidden history. This really ha- and this it shows that not saying that the South was good or that the Confederates were the good guys, but I think that again we're so tied up with the slavery issue here that if you take slavery out of the equation, there's no question who is the sympathetic side here. On one side, you have a, a plucky underdog who fought against all odds against a much bigger and more powerful foe, a David versus Goliath, for four years and did a really good job for a while. And all they were fighting for was the right to be left alone. We want just the same reason that the, uh, the colonies did against Great Britain. But because that side is equated with slavery, although the North was every bit as racist as the South by today's standards – because they're equated with slavery, that's all goes out the window, and nothing else matters. And so I think it's just – it's looking at things very superficially and looking at through the prism. Which, but this is – I've said before, and I, I I'm still expect to hear any day that, that the history itself is racist because that's the way it's looked at now. But it could, because to tell the truth, I mean, that's why the Confederate statues are torn down. They just don't they, – they, they, the way thing the, the authoritarian left today – doesn't, they don't care about facts. They don't care about it. It has to fit into their narrative of the day. And certainly any kind of slave, just, you know, they're, they're okay with the 40 million slaves that still exist around the world today, which dwarfs the 3 million or 4 million or whatever was in the United States at any one time. They don't want to hear that slavery was all over the world. They want you to believe the Hollywoodization that these uh, tobacco chewing, snarling, dripping, demonic uh, southern plantation owners were, you know, beating their property because that's what they considered them property. They were mistreating property, which doesn't make much sense. <laughs> You're trying to get a lot of work out of them, raping them left and right, treating them horribly. That's what they want you to believe. That, and, and that this situation existed nowhere else in the world. Not in ancient Rome, not today with the 40 million slaves, because it, that impacts our politics of the day, and they can get mileage out of that. They can get mileage out of that where they can still get the, uh, uh, a certain segment of their, um, of their voting population fired up, and they can get people to, uh, to, uh, to look at historical figures based on how they view things through today's president. I just think that's, that's wrong, and I'm, I'm trying to set the record straight in this book, and I hope that readers will uh, – We'll look at the actual evidence and realize that history is, as I, you know, history is it was is written by the victors, and I have that quote in the book many, many times. And uh, clearly, in the Civil War, we know who the victors were, and they're the ones that certainly have written all the history. Well, one of my favorite topics, as many can imagine, is the Lincoln assassination, April 1865. And I was speaking with Joseph McBride recently, great writer. And he actually said that this topic was one of the most under-discussed subjects that we have in our history. And I agree, because we also both noted that there is not one definitive modern book on the case. And there should be. There really should be. Um, it's a much more complex case than, you know, the Lincoln goes to a play, Booth shoots Lincoln, Booth escapes, and then Booth dies. It's much more complex than that. Well, I think uh, there's there's so many elements to it. And, 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 and in this case, Lincoln becomes, 
a more sympathetic figure because he apparently um, – it looks as if he wasn't radical enough to the radical Republicans, which is hard to believe the way he conducted the war. But uh, apparently his his idea of Reconstruction was going to be a bit uh, milder and not as onerous as the Reconstruction that actually resulted, although that wasn't even as much as the, the radical Republicans wanted something even worse. And that's why I think Andrew Johnson was eventually impeached, because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, to their liking either. But I think Lincoln – I believe like O.E. Eisenschimmel – who wrote uh, the first really critical books on this back in the 1930s and 50s through the 50s, wrote two or three books on it. I believe that Lincoln was killed from a plot within his own administration. I believe it was probably orchestrated by Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who, all we know of him, appears to have had a lot of psychotic tendencies himself. He was a bit off. Um, I believe that they... Uh, Booth certainly, you know, I think fired the shot. They killed him. I don't think there's any question about that. It's not like Oswald or anything. But uh, from there, everything else is, is, is conjecture as to who his band of uh, conspirators really were. Because most people don't realize there was an admitted conspiracy there. They hung four people um, after Booth allegedly died in Garrett's barn. But I, I think there's a lot, a lot of uh, question that he died in Garrett's barn. We don't really know. But they hung four people, including Mary Surratt, who was the first woman ever hung, an American uh, middle-aged woman who was guilty of nothing more than owning the boarding house, where Booth supposedly met with his conspirators a few times. So incredible. Uh, again, we, we, we stepped one of the first moral lines in the sand when, when we hung her. It was absolutely ridiculous. And uh, a lot of people to this day, and there was, the, there was a movie by Robert Redford made a few years back called The Conspirator, which is, was pretty good. They told the story of Mary Surratt and her daughter Anna Surratt trying to uh, get clemency for her un unsuccessfully. Three other people were hung, and so that was a conspiracy. So people said that that was their idea of a conspiracy, but the conspirators had, in fitting with the keeping with the tradition of the Lincoln years, there was a military tribunal. There was no um, there was no real trial. Uh, the defendants were not allowed to testify in their own defense. They were. They really weren't allowed to do much of anything, and they were just kind of – it was a foregone conclusion. They were going to be hung. Uh, and I, I go through a lot of the material, and there's a lot of doubt. Uh, were there more people involved? I think definitely, quite possibly, in the Stanton's actions especially. Uh, Lafayette Baker, who was the head of what was uh, the fledgling Secret Service at that time, I believe he was involved. These are, they were, There were powerful people, I think, they were involved in, in covering it up and uh, – you know, people wrote books about this, not as many as, as the, you would see after the assassination of JFK, but uh, this is a story that held me. And I think that, you know, as I write about, for instance, the, the uh, John Wilkes Booth, this is how important these narratives are to the court historians. John and I, during the course of writing this book, I, I struck up a, a relationship with uh, John Wilkes Booth's great, 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 great niece. He didn't have any direct, official, anyhow, biological children. And uh, she has been trying to spearhead the effort for a long time to get the body uh, buried in uh, Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore exhumed because his family has never believed that Booth's body's there. They believed he lived on, the body, whoever was in the barn was buried and that Booth lived on for several decades afterwards. And Finus Bates wrote, wrote a book about that. Now, here we are, you're talking about 150 plus years later. If that body was exhumed, in, 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 in almost all these in all these cases that I can figure out, the family is the final arbiter. If they want the body exhumed, it's done. It's family's wishes. Except in cases like this where historical controversy is involved. Then the government steps in. The Park Service steps in, which is unbelievable. They have blocked the Booth family forever. And I believe it's pretty obvious they are scared that it isn't him there. And if they did DNA tests... What does that say about what all the, all the uh, smearing they did of people like Otto Eisenschimmel, Linus Bates, people like that, that wrote the books of, of their era, the, the uh, anti-Warren Commission type books for the Lincoln assassination? They're vested in these narratives. They don't want to admit that their predecessors were wrong or that they're wrong and still scoffing because they've been scoffing at people like me forever. Oh, that's crazy. You know, well, it goes back even farther. Meriwether Lewis. I uh, communicated with his great, 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 great grand uh, nephew. Again, he didn't have any kids either. They can't get his body exhumed either. They've been blocked because it, it, there, it may help solve a historical. There, people believe he was murdered and he didn't kill. 
his family has an interest in that. But when the interest of a family run up against the interest of the court historians in keeping a, a particular historical uh, official narrative alive, then they win all the time. So I, I think it's in you know, it's it's important to to ask why that is, and and the Lincoln assassination. There, I mean, I, I I think I wrote a pretty thorough chapter on it. I went through. I mean, there's so many. You know, there's the. I mean, there there are little titillizing things that 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 even at this date just make you wonder. I mean, John Wilkes Booth leaving his calling card for Andrew Johnson at his hotel. I mean, you know, I mean, just you know things like that. And Mrs. Lincoln, Mary Lincoln, much like Marguerite Oswald, a century later, was pretty much the first conspiracy theorist. She uh, she questioned. She thought, sure as sure as be, Johnson had a hand in all this, and uh, you know, she talked about John Parker, the the very the very strange uh, police officer with the incredible checkered past, who was Lincoln's only uh, security that night, and who abandoned his post and was never really taken to task for it because there was no just like in the in the Kennedy assassination, there was no real investigation. They wandered, they uh, they basically got four lone nuts because Booth was dead, and they. Uh, they gave them a sham of a trial, a military tribunal, and they hung them very quickly. And so, and and anybody that questions that is uh, is a, a wacko or an extremist. And I, I agree with Joe McBride. There, uh, there definitely should be uh, more. I, I just, you know, I don't know if I have an, complete, an entire book in me on that subject, but I think I covered it pretty thoroughly in this. And I think it again, it, it all. These things are all connected, and I think that the uh, the story of the Civil War, the untold stories there, and the corruption and the the way uh, the tyranny has been kind of misdirected, I think it it, it just kind of naturally leads into this assassination, which has been misreported as well, and then the Reconstruction, which is uh, which is very devastating afterwards. That was just again uh, an extension of of the uh, the tyranny that it, that it existed during the war. And, uh, really we never, uh, you know, we kind of broke out of it eventually, but, uh, I, I think we never recovered from the constitutional, uh, overrides. And certainly that Imperial presidency of Lincoln's was the first one. And almost all presidencies have been Imperial presidencies since then to one degree or another, when compared to the, the presidencies that came before Lincoln. The imperial presidency is actually something that I've studied pretty closely as well for years. I had a college instructor, Dr. Christopher Snell, who was such a big fan of Arthur Schlesinger Jr. that his work, The Imperial Presidency, was required reading for almost every history course he taught. Yeah. So I do hold that concept near and dear to my academic history uh, and my academic heart. Um, he was important to me. He was my favorite college instructor. And so that's always been a special work to me as well. Okay, so you have a blog, you have multiple must-read books, and you are ever-present on social media. You're a great follow on Facebook, by the way, for everyone out there. But where can folks follow you and follow your work online? Well, my blog is Keeping It Unreal after my novel, The Unreals. It's donaldjeffries.wordpress.com. Uh, I am... I have a, this book coming out later. I have another book for another publisher coming out uh, beginning of next year. Uh, I'm very easy to find. You can follow my I, my work appears on Lou Rockwell. My work appears regularly in the American Free Press, uh, which you obviously know well. Uh, Naomi Wolf has published a few of my works on uh, Daily Clout. So if you Google me, you can find my work pretty easily. And I, I'm I'm easy to contact, and you certainly need to read my blog. I'm not saying goodbye to Donald right here because Donald will be joining us for the final thoughts this evening because he is directly involved in and he's <laughs> impacted by them. So we'll do that next. I'm S.D. Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show. We'll be right back. This is Dave Ratcliffe, architect and publisher of Radical.org. Why were early Warren Commission critics Vincent Salandria, May Brussel, and John Judd so valuable? For that answer more on my relationship with Fletcher Prouty and how nuclear power ties into it all, listen to episode 101 of the Midnight Rider News Show. I come to you tonight saying that this is the last time I plan on discussing this issue on the show. I believe this is already the third such time, and I'm done. But uh, Donald has a unique perspective on this as well, so I wanted to discuss this with him in tandem. Now, Donald, you and I both write for the American Free Press, the AFP, and we both do so happily. I read your work in every issue. It's fantastic. In no way do I believe that you're a racist. In no way do I believe that you're anti-Semitic. In no way do I believe that you're even mildly caustic. <laughs> but 
there are a few loud voices out there, and it's a small few, who continue to complain that we have some tie to anti-Semitism because the AFP has some original tie to the old Spotlight newspaper. In general, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a civil libertarian. I'm a populist. I'm a free thinker. I, I believe in, I'm a free speech purist. I subscribe. I proudly admit I subscribed to the Spotlight for years. Back in the day, from the time I was a very young guy, to and uh, I, I recognized it for what it was. Yes, they they seemed to blame Israel for everything. A lot of times, they saw a Mossad agent behind every tree. I understood that, but they were the only source of information back in that time, that era before the internet, where you could find really alternative information. They were they were the ones that were that wrote about Waco and Oklahoma City. They were the ones that interviewed people back when they had a thing called Radio Free America, before a lot of before these podcasts where they would have these kind of guests on talking about people that have been silenced and uh, you know, ruined by the government and so forth. Yes, they are. I, I think that uh, probably uh, many affiliated with them might have been anti-Semitic. I don't know. They had, they had um, lots of historical revisionism in there. But, you know, I looked at the good they did, and I think they, they, they did a lot of good, thought-provoking work, and they're, I used them as a source, and I was criticized for it in Hidden History. But as I pointed out at that time, in many cases, they were the only source. There was no other source because no one else was reporting it. I mean, when uh, Bo Greitz, uh, you know, who was uh, the character they based Rambo on, when he came back from a POW fact-finding tour and announced that General Kun Sa, uh, the head of the Golden Triangle uh, heroin trafficking, was blaming Richard Armitage, was actually naming the, the Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Reagan administration as the kingpin in the United States, who was involved in this heroin dealing, nobody else, even the, the rest of the press that was at that press conference put a blanket of silence. They said nothing. I wouldn't have known about it if they had done that. When, uh, when uh, Bud Dwyer, the Pennsylvania uh, state treasurer, killed himself uh, very um, sensationally, tragically, during a live news conference, and... Uh, all the rest of the the media talked about him reading a long rambling statement. The Spotlight published the rant, long rambling statement, which was in fact a detailed indictment of the corruption of then uh, Governor Richard Thornburg, who went on to become Bush the Elder's uh, Attorney General. And uh, they interviewed his widow, his wife, who was uh, very grateful. But there was no where else could you? There was nobody else that was publishing that. So. They did. A, they were. I think in many ways they were a little like Alex Jones. Although Alex Jones could never legitimately be considered anti-Semitic because if anything he bends over backwards to ignore Israel and always did. But Alex Jones did a lot of stuff too that people objected to, even at his best. But he also was the only game in town for a while, where he had a lot of guests on and stories on that nobody else was covering. I think that's the same way the spotlights uh, can be said. To, and you know they were. Uh, Lots of people, again, that's how different things were. John Wayne subscribed to the spotlight. Gloria Swanson did. I mean, these are people, back then, uh, the, there was a, a broader parameter out there for, for exchange of ideas. So it wasn't, uh, you weren't uh, you know, just automatically considered uh, beyond the pale to do that. And American free press, I don't think is anywhere near as extreme as the spotlight was, especially on Israel. So, I, you know, it's like, I, I just look at it like... I write what I write. I'm not going to put my name to anything that I, I don't believe in. So I know that they're basically supportive of Trump, and I have lost almost all my enthusiasm for Trump's populist rhetoric. So I'm not going to write anything in there. But I certainly can write all about the absurd Russian collusion, which I think is nonsense. And, I, and the other things I write about, I, I believe, and I think they're true. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I really don't – I'm not, I'm not going to uh, let myself be uh, – branded, you know, that kind of uh, tactics, guilt by association. I, I think uh, American Free Press uh, certainly is, at its worst, compares favorably to any other newspaper in the United States when you consider all the, the fake news that every one of the newspapers uh, publishes every day. Right. And I just want to get this out there as well. I have never been told by the editors for the American Free Press what I have to write about. And I've never even been told what angle I have to take on a story. Have you? No, no, I have not. I mean, I've had, as we discussed, I've had a few articles that uh, were not taken, were not um, approved, and that, but they tended to be more of my left-wing uh, survival of the richest stuff. So I understand that probably doesn't fit their uh, 
you know, their um, the template quite as much. So, I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, they want to publish my work and uh, no, I, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed by the association at all. Well, much of this stems from a man named Willis Cardo. Yes. And he was the founder of The Spotlight. He died in 2015. I was hired in late 2017, you in 2018. I never met Willis Cardo. You never met Willis Cardo. No. But I'll tell you who did. Mark Lane. Yes. And yes, for those out there, that Mark Lane of Rush to Judgment fame. Now, Lane didn't just defend the Liberty Lobby in court, as it has been told to me by people who were there. Lane spent many hours just sort of casually hanging out in Cardo's office whenever they were both in D.C. Lane and Cardo referred to one another as best friends. Yep. That's a direct tie. That's a real tie. Yet I never hear that kind of criticism of Lane. All you hear is, oh, why did he defend the Liberty Lobby? Well, it was more than just a defense. It was a real friendship between Lane and Cardo. And to be honest, Lane wasn't the only name that would be recognizable to this audience. Oh, I and neither do uh, Fletcher Prouty was sat on Liberty Lobby's board of directors, and so did comedian Dick Gregory. They both sat on Liberty Lobby, who published the Spotlight's uh, board of directors. So, I mean, Fletcher Prouty is still well-respected in the left. Dick Gregory certainly. So why why is that? So, again, I think it's just I, I wouldn't let what some really, you know, the typical, you know, kind of bitter uh, – nobody's what that what they think of that i mean we you know your your, your work uh, is, is great and uh you know you should be you should be proud of it and that you know they're they're giving us a forum to write i mean no other newspaper is, is hiring us so you know it's you know it, i i would sure if, if the if the uh washington post would start publishing the truth and 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 pay me a lot more to write for them i'd love to do that <laughs> <laughs> right and until that happens here we are. Hey, I want to thank Donald Jeffries. He's the author of the new Crimes and Cover-Ups, 1776 through 1963. And please go back on the Midnight Rider News archives at midnightridernews.com. Free archives, mind you. And listen to the shows these been on so far. They've all been excellent. From the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace.